heroes save lives. And you can be a hero right now by partnering with Weird Darkness and Food for the Poor. For a single one-time gift of only $37. How is that being a hero? Your $37 donation provides life-saving food to a child in the Caribbean or Latin America for the next six months. Please, give now as you listen to this episode. Click the red Emergency Food Relief banner at WeirdDarkness.com. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the podcast, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you're already a weirdo, please share the podcast with others. Doing so helps make it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Coming up in this episode, it's Creepy Pasta Thursday. I'll be sharing three stories this week. Back in the golden age of radio, there was a program similar to The Outer Limits or Twilight Zone. It was called Quiet, Please, and a weirdo listener asked if I'd ever considered narrating one of the stories from that radio show. Well, the actual episodes are extremely difficult to listen to nowadays due to the poor quality of the old recordings, but I was able to find a few short stories that were adapted from episodes of the series. So tonight I'll be sharing one of those stories from Quiet Please called The Room Where the Stars Live. We'll wrap up tonight's episode with a story from the Creepypasta.com website. One of their readers, J.M. Sonamo, submitted a story that got some great ratings, so I've decided to share it with you. It's called simply The Trunk. But first, a weirdo family member suggested a great short story by Ray Nelson called Eight O'Clock in the Morning. And that might sound familiar to some of you sci-fi geeks out there, because it's actually the story that the movie They Live, starring Roddy Piper, directed by John Carpenter, is based upon, a cult favorite. And you know the original books and stories are almost always better than the movies, right? We'll begin with that story. While listening to this episode, be sure to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com, you can sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, watch old horror movies for free. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Well, I'm here to tell stories and chew bubblegum. And I'm all out of bubblegum. So bolt your doors, lock your windows turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Eight O'Clock in the Morning by Ray Nelson At the end of the show, the hypnotist told his subjects, Awake! And something unusual happened. One of the subjects awoke. All the way. This had never happened before. His name was George Nada, and he blinked out of the sea of faces in the theater, at first unaware of anything out of the ordinary. Then he noticed, spotted here and there in the crowd, the non-human faces the faces of the fascinators. They had been there all along, of course, but only George was really awake, so only George recognized them for what they were. He understood everything in a flash, including the fact that if he were to give any outward sign, the fascinators would instantly command him to return to his former state, and he would obey. He left the theater, pushing out into the neon night carefully avoiding any indication that he saw the green reptilian flesh or the multiple yellow eyes of the rulers of the earth. 
One of them asked him, Got a light, buddy? George gave him a light, then moved on. At intervals along the street, George saw the posters hanging with photographs of the Fascinator's multiple eyes and various commands printed under them such as, Work eight hours, play eight hours, slept eight hours, and marry and produce. A TV set in the window of a store caught George's eye, but he looked away in the nick of time. When he didn't look at the Fascinator in the screen, he could resist the command. Stay tuned to this station. George lived alone in a sleeping room, and as he got home, the first thing he did was to disconnect the TV set. In other rooms, he could hear the TV sets of his neighbors, though. Most of the time, the voices were human. But now and then, he heard the arrogant, strangely bird-like croaks of the aliens. Obey the government, said one croak. We are the government, said another. We are your friends. You'd do anything for a friend, wouldn't you? Obey. Work. Suddenly the phone rang. George picked it up. It was one of the fascinators. Hello? It squawked. This is your control, Chief of Police Robinson. You are an old man, George Nada. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, your heart will stop. Please repeat. I am an old man, said George. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, my heart will stop. The control hung up. No, it won't, whispered George. He wondered why they wanted him dead. Did they suspect that he was awake? Probably. Someone might have spotted him, noticed that he didn't respond the way the others did. If George were alive at one minute after eight tomorrow morning, then they'd be sure. No use waiting here for the end, he thought. He went out again. The posters the TV, the occasional commands from passing aliens did not seem to have absolute power over him, though he still felt strongly tempted to obey, to see things the way his master wanted him to see them. He passed an alley and stopped. One of the aliens was alone there, leaning against the wall. George walked up to him. Move on, grunted the thing, focusing his deadly eyes on George. George felt his grasp on awareness waver. For a moment, the reptilian head dissolved into the face of a lovable old drunk. Of course, the drunk would be lovable. George picked up a brick and smashed it down on the old drunk's head with all his strength. For a moment, the image blurred, then the blue-green blood oozed out of the face, and the lizard fell, twitching and writhing. After a moment, it was dead. George dragged the body into the shadows and searched it. There was a tiny radio in its pocket and a curiously shaped knife and fork in another. The tiny radio said something in an incomprehensible language. George put it down beside the body, but kept the eating utensils. I can't possibly escape, thought George. Why fight them? But maybe… maybe he could. What if he could awaken others? That might be worth a try. He walked twelve blocks to the apartment of his girlfriend, Lil, and knocked on her door. She came to the door in her bathrobe. I want you to wake up, he said. I'm awake, she said. Come on in. He went in. The TV was playing. He turned it off. No, he said. I mean, really wake up. She looked at him without comprehension, so he snapped his fingers and shouted, Wake up! The Master's command that you wake up! Are you off your rocker, George? She asked suspiciously. You sure are acting funny. He slapped her face. Cut that out! She cried. What the hell are you up to anyway? Nothing, said George, defeated. I was just kidding around. Slapping my face wasn't just kidding around, she cried. There was a knock at the door. George opened it. It was one of the aliens. Can't you keep the noise down to a dull roar? It said. The eyes and reptilian flesh faded a little, and George saw the flickering image of a fat, middle-aged man in shirt sleeves. It was still a man when George slashed his throat with the eating knife, but it was an alien before it hit the floor. 
He dragged it into the apartment and kicked the door shut. What do you see there? He asked Lil, pointing to the many-eyed snake thing on the floor. Mr. Mr. Coney, she whispered, her eyes wide with horror. You, you just killed him like it was nothing at all. Don't scream, warned George, advancing on her. I, I won't, George. I swear, I won't. Only pl please, for the love of God, put down that knife. She backed away until she had her shoulder blades pressed to the wall. George saw that it was no use. I'm going to tie you up, said George. First, tell me which room Mr. Coney lived in. The first door on your left as you go toward the stairs, she said. Georgie, Georgie, don't torture me. If you're going to kill me, do it clean. Please, Georgie, please. He tied her up with bed sheets and gagged her, then searched the body of the fascinator. There was another one of the little radios that talked a foreign language, another set of eating utensils, and nothing else. George went next door. When he knocked, one of the snake things answered. Who is it? Friend of Mr. Coney. I want to see him, said George. He went out for a second, but he'll be right back. The door opened a crack and four yellow eyes peeped out. You want to come in and wait? Okay, said George, not looking at the eyes. You alone here? He asked as it closed the door, its back to George. Yeah, why? He slit its throat from behind, then searched the apartment. He found human bones and skulls, a half-eaten hand. He found tanks with huge, fat slugs floating in them. The children, he thought, and killed them all. There were guns, too of a sort he had never seen before. He discharged one by accident, but fortunately it was noiseless. It seemed to fire little poisoned darts. He pocketed the gun and as many boxes of darts he could and went back to Lil's place. When she saw him, she writhed in helpless terror. Relax, honey, he said, opening her purse. I just want to borrow your car keys. He took the keys and went downstairs to the street. Her car was still parked in the same general area in which she had always parked it. He recognized it by the dent in the right fender. He got in, started it, and began driving aimlessly. He drove for hours, thinking, desperately searching for some way out. He turned on the car radio to see if he could get some music, but there was nothing but news, and it was all about him, George Nada, the homicidal maniac. The announcer was one of the masters, but he sounded a little scared. Why should he be? What could one man do? George was surprised when he saw the roadblock, and he turned off on a side street before he reached it. No little trip to the country for you, Georgie boy, he thought to himself. They had just discovered what he had done back at Lil's place, so they would probably be looking for Lil's car. He parked it in an alley and took the subway. There were no aliens on the subway for some reason. Maybe they were too good for such things. Or maybe it was just because it was so late at night. When one finally did get on, George got off. He went up to the street and went into a bar. One of the fascinators was on the TV saying over and over again, We are your friends. We are your friends. We are your friends stupid lizard sounded scared. Why? What could one man do against all of them? George ordered a beer. Then it suddenly struck him that the fascinator on the TV no longer seemed to have any power over him. He looked at it again and thought, it has to believe it can master me in order to do it. The slightest hint of fear on its part and the power to hypnotize is lost. They flashed George's picture on the TV screen, and George retreated to the phone booth. He called his control, the chief of police. Hello? Robinson, he asked. Speaking. This is George Nada. I figured out how to wake people up. What? George, hang on. Where are you? Robinson sounded almost hysterical. He hung up and paid and left the bar. They would probably trace his call. He caught another subway and went downtown. 
It was dawn when he entered the building housing the biggest of the city's TV studios. He consulted the building director and then went up in the elevator. The cop in front of the studio recognized him. Why, you're Nada! he gasped. George didn't like to shoot him with the poison dart gun, but he had to. He had to kill several more before he got into the studio itself, including all the engineers on duty. There were a lot of police sirens outside, excited shouts and running footsteps on the stairs. The alien was sitting before the TV camera saying, We are your friends. We are your friends. And didn't see George come in. When George shot him with a needle gun, he simply stopped in mid-sentence and sat there dead. George stood near him and said, imitating the alien croak, Wake up! Wake up! See us as we are and kill us! It was George's voice the city heard that morning, but it was the fascinator's image, and the city did awake for the very first time and the war began. George did not live to see the victory that finally came. He died of a heart attack at exactly 8 o'clock. Creepypasta Thursday continues on Weird Darkness with a story adapted from the old radio show Quiet, Please, coming up next. As COVID-19 sweeps through the countries of the Caribbean and Latin America, the impact to the children is devastating. Hunger has become starvation. This month, Weird Darkness is partnering with Food for the Poor to provide life-saving food for these children. Your single, one-time gift of just $37 can feed a starving child for a full six months. Please, Give now as you listen to this episode. Click the red Emergency Food Relief banner at WeirdDarkness.com. <laughs> well, hello there. It's Santa, and my big night is getting closer by the day. The elves are a blur of activity, making sure all the toys are ready for the good little girls and boys on my list. You know, I love milk and cookies when I visit your home each year, well, the milk can get warm while waiting for me to arrive, and a warm toddy is not the best thing to drink if you plan on staying alert and flying around the world. Plus, the missus seems to think I might have a lactose problem due to the severe borborygmus I came home with last year. Uh, that'd be the painful and loud rumbling in the belly, that flatulence that hasn't flatulated yet. <laughs> Well, so this year, I'm asking that you instead leave me a plate of cookies and a nice hot thermos or mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. I just discovered Weird Dark Roast Coffee when Darren Marlar sent me a sample. It actually tastes like Christmas! It has a hint of cocoa and caramel, and I've been drinking a lot of it recently to wake me up early in the morning to work on toys and take care of the reindeer. And it comes in handy when having to stay up late at night working on my satellite maps to work out the best routes to take this year so I can get to your house quickly and safely. So, this year, instead of milk, leave Santa a mug or thermos of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Tell your parents they can find it right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. And be sure to tune into Weird Darkness every night from December 14th through December 24th, Christmas Eve, because Spooky Santa, that's me, will be here telling some spooky Christmas stories for you and your parents. That begins December 14th. Don't miss it. You can learn more at SpookySanta.com and then get your Weird Dark Roast coffee at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. <laughs> I can't wait for Christmas! The Room Where the Stars Live by Quiet, Please Do you remember the little house on the edge of Mount Wilson? The house that had nothing inside it? You remember the astronomer, Van Dyke? Do you remember the music, the message to the other side of the stars? We thought it was all over. 
aliens were going to land on Earth. They were going to absorb the people of the Earth as they'd absorbed Dorothy, and that would be that. It'd be like a neat little science fiction story, a cautionary tale to the next species that might think itself master of the Earth. That was 68 years ago. Nothing happened, at least we thought nothing happened. Now, now I know better. Soon, so will you. You aren't going to like it one bit, so if you want to live the rest of your life in peace, I suggest you stop reading this right now and go watch some cat videos on YouTube. Still there? Okay. You asked for it. I'll tell you. Listen. On that fateful day in 1949, when the beings from Alpha Centauri were due to land on our Earth, I was with Steve. You remember? Dorothy's brother, Steve. We went up to the top of Mount Wilson together after dark that evening because somehow it seemed like the appropriate spot to meet our fates. We were greeted there by Van Dyke as if he'd been expecting us. Van Dyke guided us to the 100-inch telescope. Steve was looking through the lens when the thing happened. The stars, he exclaimed, they're all gone. The real shock came when we both looked up at the sky directly. There were no stars anywhere in the sky. On what had been a perfectly clear night a moment earlier. Can you explain that? Nobody can. No human, anyway. A minute later, the whole sky just blinked back into existence, and everybody went on as if they hadn't noticed. At least, everybody except us three. What happens now? I asked Van Dyke, my voice quivering. Van Dyke smiled at me. Nothing, he replied. The way he said it sent a chill down my spine. After that day, Steve and I went our separate ways. I moved to a marketing job for a chemical plant in Van Nuys. I don't know what happened to Steve. I do know what happened to Van Dyke. It wasn't until 1967 that the next thing happened. I was retired by then, and I had thought to come back to the observatory one night just to banish once and for all the uneasiness that had been keeping me awake all those years. I drove up the long, windy road, got out, and stopped a moment to admire the city lights a mile below. Something caught my attention from the corner of my eye. A little house made of corrugated iron sheets with a high-peaked roof hanging on the edge of the mountain. It was the house with nothing in it. Somehow I was drawn to the house despite my fear. I walked over and pressed my hand against the cold iron door, reassuring myself that it was real, not just a figment of my imagination all these years. It was locked, of course. I must have jumped ten feet in the air when I felt the hand on my shoulder. It was Van Dyke. You're back, he said coldly. You, I stammered, you're, you're still here after all these years. Thought I must be dead by now? I can assure you I'm not. He just stared at me for a few moments with a sort of knowing look in his eye, not taking his hand off my shoulder. You want to see inside? I'll show you. Van Dyke fished a key out of one of his pockets, deposited it in the rusty old lock, and the door swung silently open. It was nothing. The absence of everything. No sight or sound or smell. It made my hair stand on end. Go on in, the old astronomer motioned to me. Go on in. I don't want to. I objected. I only wanted to get away from that place as fast as I could, yet I stood still as if entranced. Go on in, Van Dyke commanded, and with that he gave me a shove that I wouldn't have thought possible for a man his age. I fell forward, and then suddenly there was no forward or backward anymore, just nothing all around. Even my own body seemed to have disappeared. I I remember trying desperately to flail about in my panic, but 
there was nothing to flail with or in. A while later, it's hard to say how long since time starts to lose meaning here, I began to hear a faint music. At once, I recognized it as the music from the other side of the stars, the music Dorothy first heard at the bottom of the old well with the Spanish soldier. Slowly, the music grew until it enveloped me, and finally I, I felt it emanating from my own mind and felt myself slip away until there was nothing but the music. That's right, I was absorbed. No, I didn't disappear into a little gray-green ball like Dorothy had. They're just as capable of inhabiting our bodies as they are of absorbing our bodies into theirs, and apparently they've found my body convenient for some purpose. No, I'm not an alien now. I was one for nearly 50 years, but I'm not now. They can grow old and die, you see. They usually live a thousand years or more, but I got lucky. The one who absorbed me died last year. When the music finally faded out after all those years, I was able to reassert myself. It was like time travel for me. One moment I was in 1967. The next moment I woke up in 2016. I, I look perhaps five years older than I did in 67 seems our bodies age much slower while absorbed. It's taken me some time to piece things together, to work out some of what I, or rather the alien in my body, was doing all those years. The clues led me right back to Mount Wilson. I've worked out they've been building something there all these years, something from nothing behind the door of the odd old building. Finally, last night, I got it in my head to figure this thing out once and for all. I waited for the crew to arrive, waited for them to unlock the door and go inside. I waited another five minutes, then walked up and stood by the door for a moment, afraid to open it. I wasn't surprised at all to see Van Dyke stroll up, looking not a day over eighty, fifty years after we'd last met. My lack of visible surprise saved me there, because he assumed I was still absorbed. He simply nodded at me, opened the door, and walked through into the building. After another moment's pause to collect my wits, I reopened the door to follow him. It wasn't just nothing anymore. Imagine a small room with nothing around the edges but with the structure in the middle somehow dwarfing the room itself. The structure is perhaps 30 feet tall and 10 feet wide, smooth and white. It has no exact base or top, it just kind of fades around the edges. In the middle of it is a circular portal through which I could see a strange blinding landscape. Van Dyke floated toward the portal, then into it. From all around came the soft music, the voices of a conclave of beings from another world. There's not much more to tell. I would have run away, but more workmen had come up behind me. It was clear they expected me to go in, and I couldn't risk them discovering I wasn't absorbed, so I pushed off toward the portal and floated through to the other side. I'm writing this to you from an alien world, a blisteringly hot world set afire by binary suns. I don't know if I'll be able to make it back undiscovered. Perhaps my story can make it without me. This is what I've learned. The invasion happened that day in 1949 without any of us noticing. The visitors from the other side of the stars didn't choose to conquer cities like the aliens of science fiction stories because they consider us an inferior form of intelligence and have no use for our cities. They rarely absorb people. Most of them prefer to retain their natural state. They can live anywhere, but they mostly choose to live in hot deserts like the Sahara, where the climate is closest to their home planet. Relieved? Not so fast. They are very patient people, very methodical. 
they've decided to adjust our climate to be more like theirs. Climate where a scorching Sahara summer is the norm planet-wide. They've decided to achieve this not by taking any great action of their own, but simply by manipulating the human population into starting a runaway greenhouse effect. Have you heard the reports about the disappearing Arctic sea ice or about Antarctic ice shelves thousands of years old breaking apart in a matter of weeks? Did you read about the recent winter heat wave up in Canada? Global warming, they say. Listen carefully on a hot day this summer. You may hear a faint, unearthly music on the wind. I have one more story to share on this Creepypasta Thursday. Up next is a tale written by J. M. Sinamo called The Trunk When Weird Darkness Returns. Because of COVID-19, markets are closed. Businesses are shuttered. Such unprecedented circumstances demand an extraordinary response. This month, Weird Darkness is partnering with Food for the Poor to provide emergency food relief to children who are literally starving in the Caribbean and Latin America. Your single one-time gift of just $37 will feed a child for the next six months. You can rescue these vulnerable lives today with your donation of any amount. Please give now while you're listening to this episode. Click the red Emergency Food Relief banner at WeirdDarkness.com. We've come back around to the time of year where you have to go looking for a new calendar for 2021. What'll it be this time? Cute cats? Again? A word of the day? How cliché. How about a 2021 cryptid calendar? Twelve months of creepy yet beautifully painted scenes from master artist and fellow weirdo Timothy Wayne Williams. Once you've soaked in the gorgeous imagery, you can take it to the next level because every scene also contains a hidden hominid. And you know Bigfoot is the hide-and-seek champion. I've seen many of the original paintings used in this calendar, and I've only found Bigfoot about half the time, but he is there, somewhere. And with a 2021 cryptid calendar, you'll have a whole month at a time to look for him. And if you give up looking, you can even email the artist personally and he'll point out our hairy friend for you. Get it now before orders get overwhelming. The 2021 Cryptid Calendar. You'll find a link to it at WeirdDarkness.com. The Trunk by J. M. Sonamo Moving Day a chance to start fresh in a new place. New opportunities. New community. New home. Home. Not just a house. To Eric Sherman, this was a place he could finally call home. No ex-wives to hound him for alimony. No disapproving parents to question his absence of faith and atheist lifestyle. No bitchy neighbors threatening to call the authorities about his over-the-top Halloween displays. No, this house was different. For one, it was in a more rural and secluded county. There was no HOA to worry about. His nearest neighbor was almost half a mile away. Before Eric had moved in, he made it a point to go and meet him and ask some questions about the community. So how long have you lived around here, Mr. Holt? Eric asked. Oh, hell, the old man began. Call me Henry. Everyone else around these parts does. Henry took a long drag from his cigarette. But to answer your question, I've been here my whole life. I inherited the house and little farm from my pa after he passed in 75. Henry extinguished what was left of his cigarette in a small glass ashtray before slipping another one out of its wrinkled pack. "'You grow anything on the farm?' Eric asked. Henry gestured over his shoulder, swirling smoke through the air with his newly lit cigarette. "'Just some squash and the like. In the fall I grow pumpkins, and 
Let the city folk come and pick them for Halloween. You like Halloween, son? Eric's eyes lit up. Ever since he was a boy, Halloween had been his favorite holiday. He enjoyed being scared and using his extensive collection of decorations and props to scare others. Yes, sir, I do. In my last house, my ex-wife and I would put up quite a display. Sometimes we'd even make a little haunted walkthrough in our yard. Some of the neighbors said our displays were too intense and made too much noise. Henry chuckled and took another long drag. Well, <laughs> Henry began, you don't have to worry about that around here. I'm your closest neighbor and I love all that spooky stuff. Noise won't be your problem neither. My hearing's been going these past few years, so if you want to rile up the folk that come out this way for pumpkins and trick-or-treating, I say have at it." The two men chatted for a few more hours. Eric told Henry about some of his more gruesome Halloween displays, and Henry told Eric about which shops were closest and had the best prices. Well, Henry, Eric said as he shook the old man's hand, I look forward to living up the road from you. Same here, son, Henry replied. Treat that old house good. Like all old things, handle her with care and she'll treat you right. A week later, Eric was finishing unloading the boxes from the moving truck and into the old country house. He wiped the sweat from his forehead, gazed up at his new home, and let out a satisfied home. The farmhouse was huge, much bigger than Eric's last house and more than enough for a bachelor and his dog, a border collie named Circe. Eric wasn't bothered by the extra space, more room to store props and decorate with macabre knickknacks. Horror and grotesquities were not reserved solely for Halloween. Eric enjoyed adorning his shelves, mantles, and countertops with skulls, bones, old crumbling books, and other bizarre curios he acquired over the years. As he was carrying the last of the Halloween boxes up to the attic, Eric stumbled, sending the box crashing to the floor. He frantically pulled open the cardboard flaps and sighed with relief. Nothing had broken. He then turned to see what had caused him to lose his footing. There, at the base of the attic steps, was a noticeably loose floorboard. Eric grabbed a hammer, nails, and flashlight from his toolbox and made his way to the attic doorway. He clicked the flashlight on to find the best place to hammer the board down when he noticed something tucked away just under the loose board. Using the claw end of the hammer, Eric pried the other nails out of the floorboard. The space beneath the floor had an old, musty smell the kind of odor one expects to smell in a second-hand shop or antique store. As the beam from his flashlight scanned the dust-caked alcove, Eric finally saw what had caught his eye. Before him sat a small, antique black trunk. Eric lifted the box from his hiding place and wiped the dust from it with his shirt sleeve. The box was made of very sturdy wood that had been painted black by its creator. The lid was slightly domed and secured with a large antique lock. Emblazoned across the front of the lid were letters that Eric instantly recognized as Hebrew. Eric rubbed his stubbled chin as he tried to make out the letters. He had taken Hebrew lessons as a child, but he hadn't studied or read anything in the language since his bar mitzvah. Now, in his late thirties, the letters seemed alien to him. He thought about calling his mother and asking her what it said, but their relationship had been rocky ever since she told him that she could not accept that he had abandoned his faith. At any rate, Eric knew he had to see what was inside. He went back to his toolbox and returned once again, this time with a pair of bolt cutters. Eric placed the cutters on the lock, and with one firm squeeze, the lock snapped in half. He removed the remnants of the broken lock from the latch, and without warning, the lid flew open with a horrible screech. Eric jumped back from the sudden noise. After taking several deep breaths, he clutched his chest and laughed a bit to himself. He walked back over to the now opened trunk and peered inside. Eric's eyes lit up as they had at Henry's when he mentioned Halloween. Inside, 
there was an assortment of bizarre trinkets. A small jar filled with teeth, five rusted nails fastened together with twine, a desiccated frog, a small jar of what looked to be rock salt. But among the various oddities, the most impressive was an antique jester marionette. The puppet glared up at Eric with lifeless blue eyes and a sardonic grin that was thinly framed by a pair of blood-red lips. Eric reached toward the limp figure to inspect it when, with a loud wooden snap, its mouth popped open. "'Oh, crap!' Eric gasped as he recoiled and withdrew his hand from the marionette. His heart began racing and the sound of pumping blood filled his ears. From the downstairs living room, Searcy had begun to bark. "'It's all right, girl!' Eric shouted. "'Daddy was just being a wuss!' As courage crept its way back into Eric's body, he noticed a small piece of paper in the puppet's mouth. He slipped the paper out of the doll's open maw and found the same Hebrew lettering on it. Huh, "'Must be your name,' Eric wondered aloud. With that, he placed everything back in the trunk and decided he would ask Henry if he knew anything about it tomorrow morning. Eric sat on Henry's porch as the blazing autumn sun beat down on him. Though it was still early in the morning, the temperature had already reached an uncomfortable 91 degrees. This heat and the accompanying humidity were not uncommon for the area, but it was more than Eric was used to. Sweat drops had already formed on Eric's forehead, and his clothes began to cling to his body with sweat. A mysterious trunk sat on the small patio table in between the two men. "'Any idea what it could be?' Eric asked Henry as the two studied the box and its contents. "'Looks like a lot of weird stuff,' Henry replied. "'Hell, son, thought you was into all that spooky stuff.' Eric chuckled. Henry had a good point. This was the exact type of thing Eric would go out of his way to find at antique stores and estate sales. Eric was about to reply when Henry gestured to the inscription on the trunk. "'Ain't those them uh, Jewish letters?' Henry asked. Eric nodded as he took a sip of water from his bottle. "'Yeah,' Eric replied. "'Hebrew. Was the previous owner Jewish?' Henry let out a deep sigh and shook his head solemnly. "'Now, my pa and I uh, always had our suspicions about Kurtz,' Henry began. "'The old feller that lived in that house before you, mean old bastard. Thick German accent. Bought the place you was living in around 1950. Pa always said to keep away from him. Told me, only good Nazi is a dead Nazi. That old bastard must have stole this off of some poor Jewish fella thinking it'd be valuable someday. Eric looked at Henry with a steady gaze swallowed the lump that had built up in his throat. My family is Jewish, Henry. They, uh, they escaped the Nazis in Poland and fled to America when the war was over. Henry placed a hand on Eric's shoulder and gave a reassuring smile. Son, I know it might seem strange living in that place knowing what you know now, replied Henry, but maybe this is restitution of sorts. That old prick is dead and buried. Now you live in his house, and you've reclaimed something that belonged to your kin. Yes, sir. This is just your people reclaiming what is rightfully theirs. Eric forced a smile and looked down at the box. The puppet met his gaze with its own cruel smile. Eric turned back to Henry. But why wouldn't the realtor have said something about this? Henry let out a laugh. <laughs> Boy, even if they knew the old fool's history, do you really think that'd be something they'd advertise? <laughs> Henry replied. Eric knew he was right. No sane person would stop on a real estate listing that read, Rural Farmhouse, Country Living, Former Fascist Occupant. Eric thanked Henry for his time, gathered up the trunk and its inhabitants, and started to walk down the dirt road that led to his house. Henry called after Eric, "'What you gonna do with that creepy puppet?' Eric turned and replied, "'Well, Halloween's in a couple weeks. 
I think you'll look pretty good on my mantle. Before long, Eric had started putting up his Halloween display. He would spent years purchasing and collecting the most grotesque and gory pieces he could find. His once scenic front yard was now an avatar littered with limbs and heads festooned with intestines and manned by blood-soaked animatronic clowns. Henry came by a few times a week to see how the displays were coming along. Each time he'd ask Eric if it was finished, and each time Eric would tell him there was always room for more. Inside the farmhouse was more tame by comparison, but still it had its fair share of horror. Actual skulls and bones Eric had acquired from various collectors adorned his walls. Antique surgery tools and dental phantoms sat proudly on his end tables and counters. Preserved rodents, bats, and spiders occupied his mantle, along with the contents of the trunk, the marionette taking center stage. Eric had decided to name the marionette Jerry. Both he and Henry agreed the puppet's angular features, rectangular head, and broad smile made it look like a medieval Jerry Seinfeld. Eric had just finished putting up a few more decorations and lights when he decided to turn in for the evening. The heat was still pretty intense during the day, and all of the outdoor decorating had drained the energy out of him. He took Circe on her nighttime walk, making sure to pick up after her. Though dog feces can be quite scary, they were not welcome in his display. Eric and Circe came back inside, and Eric told her it was time for bed. The dog curled up on her favorite wing-back chair, put her head down, and blew air out of her nose the way a disappointed child would respond if you told him it was time for bed. Eric crossed the living room toward the stairs leading up to his room. As he reached for the light switch, he turned toward his dog. Good night, Circe. You are such a good girl today. Circe did not get up or even open her eyes but her tail began to wag energetically to show him she understood. Eric then turned toward the mantle. Good night, Jerry. Keep an eye on the other decorations for me, will you? As if in response, Jerry's mouth snapped open with that distinct wooden click sound. Circe began to whimper and growl in her sleep as the hair on her scruff bristled. Eric felt all the little hairs stand up on the back of his neck as he stared at the puppet in shocked disbelief. Calm down, he thought to himself, it's just an old doll. He made his way cautiously over to the mantle, his eyes locked in a staring contest with Jerry's. Eric reached out with a trembling hand to close the puppet's mouth, expecting the thing to spring to life at any minute. He placed a finger on Jerry's chin and slowly pushed its mouth closed. Eric sighed with relief and made his way back to the light switch, never taking his eyes off of Jerry. I'll find some wood glue in the morning and take care of that jaw problem you got there, Jerry, Eric joked, maybe even give you a fresh coat of paint. With that, Eric turned out the lights and went to his room to have one of the most troubling sleeps of his adult life. That night, Eric could not sleep. His dreams were a labyrinth of nightmares that he struggled to escape. Images of Jerry and his terrible grin haunted Eric's every wakeless second, forcing him to jolt awake and scan the room for the demonic doll. Every creak, every tap, every subtle noise caused Eric to spring awake. It was getting to the point where he wasn't sure if it was better to just stay awake and try to take a nap in the morning. At around 6 a.m., a new noise had shocked Eric from his bed. Downstairs, he could hear the distinct sounds of Circe barking and snarling. Eric felt a knot form in his stomach. Maybe it's just a rat, Eric hoped as he climbed out of bed. The dog's barking grew louder and more fierce. Eric knew he had to go downstairs and investigate, but fear slowed his movements to a glacial pace. The stairs from the second floor creaked with unease as he crept downstairs to see what Circe was barking at. Eric peered through the living room doorway. However, what he saw was more annoying than startling. His mantle display had been knocked down and strewn about the floor. 
broken display boxes and animal specimens littered the area rug that was below the mantel and in front of the fireplace. The one startling aspect of the scene was that Jerry did not fall all the way to the ground. His marionette controls and strings had snagged the edge of the mantel, causing the puppet to hang and sway like a corpse on a noose. Jerry's mouth hung open as Circe barked and snarled at him. Circe! Eric yelled. What did you do? Despite Eric's accusations, the dog continued to bark and lunge at the dangling puppet. Eric grabbed Circe's collar and dragged her toward the kitchen. He told Circe to sit and stay, shutting the door behind him as he returned to the mess she had left. Eric got a broom and began to sweep the broken glass from the rug. From the look of things, he would not be able to save any of the pieces. Once he was sure he had cleaned up all the glass, Eric untangled the marionette string and sat Jerry back on the mantel. I guess Circe thinks you're creepy too, Eric said aloud to the doll. As he turned to let Circe out of the kitchen, Eric felt a sharp pain in the bottom of his foot. Ow! Eric screamed as he grabbed his foot to see what he had stepped on. A small piece of glass protruded from his heel, glistening in the light as a tiny red stream of blood began to trickle from the wound. Eric hobbled over to the couch and examined his injury. He pushed on the skin around the glass to force it to the surface. He plucked the shard from his foot as blood began to stream faster from the puncture. Eric hopped over to the bathroom, cleaned his wound, and covered it with a bandage. Upon returning to the living room, Eric found Jerry slumped over and lying on his side. Eric limped over to the mantel, not wanting to put pressure on his foot. As he reached for the puppet, Jerry's mouth snapped open again. Eric quickly recoiled his hand. Before he had time to register this new fear, he was startled again by a loud bang at his front door. Eric cried out in surprise. Eric, you in there? Henry's familiar voice called from the front door. Still slightly panicked, Eric hobbled over to the front foyer and answered the door. Eric smiled a weak smile at Henry. Hey, Henry, Eric said. How's it going? Henry looked Eric up and down. He could tell things were out of the ordinary. I was just going for my morning stroll and decided to see how the display was coming along. Henry replied, but from the look of things, you've had quite the morning. Eric nodded and explained to Henry what had transpired since the dog had made the mess. Henry shook his head. Yes, that dog of yours hasn't taken a shine to old Jerry yet, huh? Well, at any rate, I just wanted to say your yard decorations are getting pretty sick, even for my taste. Eric gave Henry a quizzical look. Henry, I haven't added anything to the outside display. Henry looked confused, and the two stepped outside onto the front porch. Dangling from the trees were dozens of dead mice and birds, swaying lazily in the light breeze. Eric swallowed hard. He was suddenly aware the strings that were wrapped around each animal were identical to the ones that were on Jerry. Uh, Henry, Eric stammered, I didn't hang these. Henry gave Eric a stern look. Listen, boy, Henry started, I'm all for a good scare here and there, but this may drive business away from my farm. I'm asking, as a friend, please take them down. Eric, not looking down from the ghoulish menagerie, nodded silently. Henry patted him on the shoulder. I'm happy you're getting into the spirit of things, but don't go getting carried away. With that, Henry started back down the dirt road toward his house. Eric retrieved the ladder from the shed and began the grim task of removing the lifeless creatures from his trees. As he finished taking the last morbid ornament down, he heard Circe barking from inside the house. Eric climbed down the ladder and burst through the front door. To his horror, he found Jerry sitting upright in Circe's chair. Eric rushed over to the puppet, snatched it off the chair, and chucked it into the fireplace. He then shoved some newspaper and scrap wood under Jerry and struck a match. As he set the ghastly pyre ablaze, Jerry's mouth fell open once again with a hideous click. 
that night. Eric gathered what remained of the trunk's contents and threw them in the trash. He snapped a picture of the box with his phone and, begrudgingly, sent it in an email to his mother. He hated contacting her after their falling out, but she knew how to read Hebrew. As he hit send, he glanced over at the fireplace. The fire continued to blaze, but all remnants of Jerry had become smoldering ash. Eric had just walked into the kitchen to get a glass of water when he felt his phone buzzing in his pocket. He pulled the phone out of his pocket. The caller ID simply read, Mom. He took a deep breath and answered, Hey, Ma. Hello, Eric, she responded. I just got your email. What exactly am I looking at? Eric did not want to tell her all that had happened since he found the trunk. It's this really old box that was left by the previous owner. I can't make out what the Hebrew says on the lid. Eric heard his mother sigh. You don't, you don't even remember enough Hebrew to read a short word like that, his mother scolded. Well, at any rate, I hope you left that thing alone. Eric began to feel the hair on his neck stand up. Why? Eric asked. What's it say? Daibuk, his mother responded. Old superstition. They're like demons or spirits. The word actually means adhere or cling. Eric took a deep breath, but before he could respond, he heard a sharp yelp from the living room. Mom, I'm going to have to call you back. Eric hung up the phone and bolted into the living room. The sight that greeted him sent his head spinning. Searcy was thrashing about on the floor in front of the fireplace. Protruding from the ashes was a long, sickly, pale arm. Its skeletal fingers were firmly wrapped around the dog's neck. Searcy! Eric shouted. With that, the arm gave a quick twist, breaking the dog's neck with a terrible snap. The arm raised Searcy's lifeless form into the air. Then, with one swift motion, threw the dog toward the front door. Eric stood frozen in horror, not knowing what to do or where to run. Before his senses could fully return, all of the lights suddenly snapped off and the fire went out. Eric groped behind him for the kitchen door, eyes fixated on the unlit fireplace. Bzzz. Eric's phone buzzed violently in his hand. The screen illuminated. The caller ID said, Jerry. Before he could do anything, the phone accepted the call and switched to speaker mode. A shrill, unearthly screech emanated from the device as images of an eyeless, gaunt face in jester paint flashed on the screen. Suddenly, the phone went dark and the screeching stopped. In the darkness, Eric heard something slump onto the floor in the direction of the fireplace. As he turned to run into the kitchen, he heard the sickening thumping of the creature crawling toward him. Henry stood in Eric's yard. An old cigarette clung to his lips. He shook his head. Mr. Holt, I'll ask you one more time. What were you doing in the deceased's yard so early in the morning? Henry took a long drag from the cigarette. I told you, officer, me and him had become very close. We was fixing to be partners round Halloween time. He'd spook the young'uns and city folks, and I'd sell them pumpkins. Poor kid. I knew he was in a bad place. Told me about his wife leaving him. Told me about not being on good terms with his folks. I, I knew something was off, but never guessed he'd do something like this. The two men turned around to re-examine the horror of which they spoke. In a tree, high above the Halloween grotesquities, hung Circe, a coarse rope pulled tight around her neck. Hanging beside her swung Eric, face made up to resemble the marionette sitting upon the branch, suspending them. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast and you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so now so you don't miss future episodes. And also, please, tell someone else about the podcast. 
Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Plus, telling others about Weird Darkness also helps get the word out about resources that are available for those who suffer from depression, so please, share the podcast with someone today. Weird Darkness was ranked 16 in Podcast Magazine's Hot 50 chart for December, so where is it going to be in January? Well, that's up to you. You can vote for the podcast every day to help it move up the charts. You can vote for Weird Darkness right now by clicking the link in the show notes or click on Vote at WeirdDarkness.com. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. Stories on Creepypasta Thursday episodes are works of fiction, and links to the stories or the authors can be found in the show notes. Weird Darkness Theme by Alibi Music Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness 2020 And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 20, verse 22 Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord, and He will deliver you. And a final thought, nothing you wear is more important than your smile. Connie Stevens I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Last May and June, I spent several weeks giving you, my weirdo family, the opportunity to join me and save the lives of children who were starving in Haiti and Guatemala. And we raised money for Food for the Poor. And because of you, we literally saved the lives of over a hundred children. We were working in cooperation with others at the same time, but it is estimated that Weird Darkness listeners alone brought in approximately $4,000 during that time, and that provided life-saving food for six months for about 108 children. That's 108 children who would not be alive today if it were not for you who were so generous six months ago. I need your help to do that again. I know COVID-19 has hit all of us hard, but it hit the poorest areas of Central and South America the hardest. Not only are they in quarantine, but unlike us, they don't have any government assistance or food banks or shelters to turn to for the help that they so desperately need. They were already hungry before coronavirus arrived. Now that the pandemic has hit, they are past hunger and dealing with starvation now. Most children in the poor areas of Central and South America only receive one meal each day, and that meal is provided by the school they attend, but now those schools have been forced to close their doors due to the quarantine. So those children are now receiving zero meals each day. Think back on how long you've been in quarantine. For many of us, that's coming up on nine months. Now imagine that whole time with no food at all. That's why I'm asking you to partner with me, with Weird Darkness and Food for the Poor, to literally save the lives of these children and families. This isn't hunger that we're alleviating, it's starvation. But the good news is that you can save the life of one of those children or family members with a single, one-time, tax-deductible donation of just $37. That's all, just $37, given one single time. That single gift will feed a child for a full six months. If you can do more, $74 will feed two children for six months. How many are in your family? Could you give $37 on behalf of each of your own family members? If you're a family of five, that would be a single one-time gift of only $185, but that brings emergency food relief to a whole family for a full six months. Maybe you're feeling led to take it a step further and make a monthly pledge of $10. It sounds small, 
and some people might never even miss $10 being deducted from their checking account or their debit card each month. But that adds up to $120 over a year, which provides life-saving food to three children. You're saving the lives of three human beings for that $10 per month, or make it a gift of $111 to do the same. Honestly, any amount you choose to donate as a one-time gift or a monthly pledge, whatever works best for you is going to make an enormous impact on the family that receives it. So please, give now as you're listening to this episode. Click the Emergency Food Relief banner at WeirdDarkness.com. Or if you'd rather donate by phone, the number is 855-901-4673. That's 855-901-4673. Or click the Emergency Food Relief banner at WeirdDarkness.com. 